All right, can you guys see my uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, wait. Make sure. All right, sorry about that. I had to check something. All right, so <clears throat> let's go through the PowerPoint. Um, and then if you have any questions after, you can just ask me or you can slow me down while we're in it. The chapter 24 material is fairly straightforward. Um, obviously, we're not identifying any of these organs. So the main thing you're trying to get out of this chapter <clears throat> is knowing which organs are obviously part of the, the digestive system and what their main roles and functions are. Some of the more detailed information is going to come from once we start, I'll show you where the enzyme information is and, and what organs are producing which enzymes. It's going to be very similar to the people that have lab. You know how you, you had to start learning some of those enzymes. Uh, we're going to learn some of those again in here, and we're going to have some questions on that. Which organ produces the enzyme? Which enzymes break down which types of food molecules? Things like that. All right, so let's look at the digestive system as a whole. The digestive system <clears throat> is composed of organs and structures and glands and whatnot that are actually lumped into two different categories. So there are some of the organs and structures which are actually part of what we call the gastrointestinal canal, which is basically a hollow tube. It starts at your mouth and ends at your anus. And it's the passageway for all of our food and where the food will be processed and prepared to be used uh, in part by the cells in the body. The other types of structures that are part of the digestive system are called accessory organs or structures because those particular glands or organs or structures are not part of the hollow tube directly. So only the structures that are part of the hollow tube are called the gastrointestinal canal, right? So obviously we have our mouth, which is in our, the oral cavity with our tongue and our teeth. We have salivary glands, everybody knows that. Um, and so we chew our food up, we mix it with saliva. Uh, we make it a semi-liquid ball called a bolus that we then swallow. The food is swallowed down the esophagus to our stomach. So you see how the obviously hollow tube. So the stomach is part of that tube. And the stomach is going to churn our food up and mix it with what's called gastric juice. The food items in there will be liquefied into a form called chyme, as we'll see in a minute. And that chyme, the liquid food, moves through your intestines, small intestines, large intestines, and then obviously the fecal matter, waste products come out when we go to the bathroom. So that's, the, that's what we call the alimentary canal or the gastrointestinal tract. But lying on the outside of that that uh, tract are things like the liver. Your salivary glands are not part of the tube. Your tongue and your teeth aren't part of the tube. The gallbladder, the pancreas, things like this are called accessory organs. So I made two slides for them. You can see the gastrointestinal uh, tract organs right here that I name out, pretty simple. Just know those are part of what we call the GI tract. And then the accessory organs of digestion, uh, which obviously your teeth, your tongue, those things I just mentioned all listed out right here. So pretty simple. Know which ones are accessory and which ones are part of the tract. Not too terribly difficult. Um, the actual digestive system performs six different functions. And we're gonna talk about these uh, a little bit within each structure and organ and what they're achieving through the digestive process. But obviously we have to eat our food. You take it into the system, that's called ingestion. So you eat your food, you chew it up in your mouth, you make it into a semi-liquid ball of food, which is called a bolus. Um, and then we introduce it into the GI tract. Then throughout the lining of the GI tract and from accessory organs, in fact, there's what we call secretion. There's various hormones that's gonna regulate some of this. We're gonna talk about three of them. Uh, and then all the enzymes, which are secreted by special cells and glands along the way that will be involved in 
chemically digesting our food items. So we call that portion secretion. The food also has to be propelled through the GI tract <clears throat> from start to finish. That's just called motility. And it's achieved by obviously muscle contraction. The muscle layers that are, are along the lining of the wall of the GI tract. And then we actually have digestion. Now digestion is actually separated into two components. And I'm gonna tell you what those are. Those are, it's called mechanical and chemical digestion. And I'm gonna define them a little bit more later, but here they just say, okay, we digest our food. So what does that mean really? Well, the term digestion means that you're just taking large food molecules and breaking them down into smaller food molecules, all right? And there's two ways that we achieve that mechanical and chemical digestion. And then we have to absorb our nutrients from the GI tract. The majority of that absorption is going to occur in a small intestine, but that's not the only place. And so we absorb it into the blood and or the lymphatic system, even though they don't show the lymphatic system here. I'll mention it in a minute. And then we have to have uh, the elimination of our waste products, which are the products that we don't utilize. And that's called defecation. That's when we go to the bathroom. So these are the six main functions generically that the digestive system will perform for us. Now, the salivary glands are lined around our oral cavity. Now, we're not identifying them on the lecture test. Um, and pretty much what we're going to learn about them is what they make and what their primary function is, which I'm going to show you on a slide in a minute. But you should know the names of the glands, and they're all paired. The largest of the three pairs are called the parotid glands. We also have, which are just anterior to your, to your ear on the lateral portions of your jaw. So if you find your earlobe and just go forward a little bit and you push right there on the, the uh, back of your jaw, that's where your parotids are. And then we have the submandibular glands, which are the glands that are below the mandible. That's what this word actually means, submandibular. And we also have a pair that line the underside of our tongue which are called the sublinguals. So the salivary glands obviously produce a product which is generically called saliva. But we have to learn a couple of things that are in saliva and what those enzymes do for us. So here are the two ways that we break food items down. We can do it mechanically or chemically. So all throughout the digestive tract, there's mechanical digestion and there's chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion does not break any chemical bonds in molecules. No chemical bonds are broken in, unless they're macerated, are broken down via a chemical. So basically what mechanical digestion is, is the physical breakdown of a large, of a large food item down to smaller food items. So we're not really manipulating the molecules that make up the item that you ate, you're just breaking them down to smaller parts, right? That's called mechanical digestion. So the easiest one to learn about mechanical digestion is when you chew your food up. So you don't just take a whole hamburger and stick it into your stomach. You break it physically down to smaller parts. That would be called mechanical digestion. So obviously our teeth are involved with that. Your tongue is involved with that as well because your tongue manipulates the food items that are in your mouth while you're chewing them up. But we also have mechanical digestion in other places in the GI tract as well, like in our stomach. When your smooth muscle around your stomach begins to contract, it starts to churn that food up and continuously physically breaks it down to smaller parts. That achieves a couple of things. One, it allows more of the food molecule to be mixed with the liquid in the stomach, which is called gastric juice. And it increases the surface area of all of those molecules to be available for enzymes to attack the bonds. So enzymes literally have to get into the molecule where they can just clip those bonds apart. And if the, if the food items are in smaller components, then the chemical digestive process is more efficient. So chemical digestion occurs down the length of the entire tube. So Chemical digestion begins in our mouth with the actions of enzymes in saliva. And there's two principal enzymes that act in our mouth. One of them 
is in saliva is called salivary amylase. The other enzyme that acts in our mouth is called a lingual lipase. And I'm going to tell you what those things do in a minute on a chart. But you can see here that an amylase breaks down carbohydrates, polysaccharides. So if you eat any starchy food, you begin to break down the starch, which is a carbohydrate. It's a polysaccharide. It's a big, long molecule made of sugar, glucose. So we actually chemically begin to break down starch and other polysaccharides in our mouth. We also have lingual lipase, and, and lipases break down lipids. So let's look at this slide right here. There's only one thing on this chart that I want you guys to study, and that's the very top up here dealing with the salivary glands. So all three pair of salivary glands secretes saliva, albeit some, a pair secretes a more watery saliva, one secretes a more mucousy saliva. I'm not getting into all of that, but in general, the saliva, it helps start to begin to liquefy our food. So what is the function? Well, it moistens and lubricates our food, softens it up, and that saliva also rinses the inside of your mouth. So there's molecules in your saliva that can help kill off bacteria. That's not too much when I'm concerned with digestion, but the enzymes in saliva include salivary amylase, which has the job of breaking down large polysaccharides like starch into smaller sugars, typically disaccharides um, like maltose, but also some that are, you know, three sugars long. And so maltotriose is three sugars. So these are broken down components of starch when we break that down. So these that you see here are made of glucose molecules. Uh, other polysaccharides are made of glucose or fructose and galactose, other molecules like that. But as far as starch is concerned, it's all glucose that are broken down to smaller chains of sugars. So we begin that process with the action of salivary amylase as we begin to mix our food up with saliva. The other importance of mixing your food up and liquefying it a little bit and moistening it is it allows us to be able to taste our food. We cannot taste anything if it's dry. It has to be in a, uh, dissolved in a liquid first. And so saliva aids in that process. Now our esophagus is involved with propelling food, which is a, what we call a bolus. It's a semi-liquid ball that we begin to swallow. And the esophagus obviously connects our oral cavity and our throat, which is called the pharynx, to our stomach. So with smooth muscle contraction down the length of the esophagus, your food items that you're swallowing will make its way to the stomach. Everybody knows that. But I want us to know the phases of swallowing. And the process of swallowing is just called deglutition. That's what this word is right here. So the three phases of deglutition involve the first phase called the voluntary phase. And that's where we have, we, we're chewing our food up, we're mixing it with saliva, and we begin to force that ball of food called a bolus to the back of our oral cavity. It's called the voluntary phase because you have voluntary control over that phase. You control when you begin to force the food items to the back of your pharynx in order to begin the involuntary stages which begins with what we call the pharyngeal phase or the pharyngeal stage. During the pharyngeal stage, once that bolus of food is at the back of your throat, which again is called the pharynx, your food is destined to go to your stomach. Unless you have a massive coughing reflex, in other words, if you started to swallow something down your windpipe, your trachea, that food item is going to go down the esophagus and go to the stomach. It's an involuntary phase. So what happens during this phase? Well, two important things really happen. One, when we swallow, I don't know if you ever noticed, but your tongue pushes upward. So your tongue pushes upward, which achieves the pressing against what we call the soft palate and the uvula which pushes up and closes off our what's called the nasopharynx and thus the opening to your nasal cavity. 
in this way, while we, while we swallow food, the food doesn't come back out of our nose, right? So that's one thing that happens. We don't want our, the food that we're swallowing to go back up into the nasal cavity. So the uvula and the, and the palate pushes up against the opening of the nasopharynx. Also, there is a piece of cartilage that's part of your voice box. We haven't learned them yet, but our voice box is called the larynx. And there's a piece of cartilage there called the epiglottis. The role of the epiglottis is to fold over the opening of your trachea as you swallow food. So notice the esophagus runs posterior. This is the back of your neck. This would be the front. It runs posterior to your windpipe. So as we swallow food, that epiglottis is forced in a downward position in order to close off this opening. That opening is also called the remiglottis, by the way. We're going to learn that later. But we close the opening of our windpipe off, and when that happens, you temporarily can't breathe. So right as you swallow, during that one little part, you can't take a breath in or out. It's just a temporary cessation of breathing when we swallow. So this is called the pharyngeal stage. Now, once this bolus of food makes its way past the larynx, and all of this is called the pharynx, by the way, we have what's called the nasopharynx right here, the oropharynx, which is the back of your oral cavity, and then the laryngopharynx, which is right here. All of that is the pharynx. So once that bolus of food makes its way past the larynx, you then go to the, se the second of the two involuntary stages, which is called the esophageal stage. And once that bolus of food reaches the esophagus, there's involuntary muscle contraction of smooth muscle, circular and longitudinal muscle around the length and down the length of your esophagus. And that contraction, which are called peristalsis, causes the bolus of food to make its way to the opening of the esophagus to the stomach. Now, the area where the esophagus meets the stomach, that area of the stomach in general is called the cardia or the cardiac region. One of the most important structures in that region is this sphincter. There's a sphincter muscle right here. It's called the lower esophageal sphincter. And as the bolus of food makes its way down towards the sphincter, the sphincter involuntarily relaxes and basically opens up and allows the bolus of food to enter the stomach. Now, once that bolus of food enters the stomach, that esophageal sphincter will contract again and close off this opening. So that while the stomach is contracting and churning up your food, your food cannot be forced back up through the esophagus. That in fact is what happens if you vomit. If you're sick and you need to vomit or you, you feel like you need to vomit, there's an involuntary reflex from the autonomic nervous system that causes this esophageal sphincter to relax at the same time that the stomach contracts and the contents of the stomach is forced back up through the esophagus. Now, as far as the functions of the stomach are concerned, besides getting into the, all of the enzymes yet, your stomach mixes everything. So all the saliva we just swallowed, the, the partially mechanically and partially chemically digested food items, they're all being mixed up in the stomach and it turns it into a liquid. So all your solid food items that you just swallowed will turn into a, a liquid form of food called chyme, right? I noticed on another slide in here somewhere, I misspelled that. This is the correct spelling, by the way, chyme. So that chyme is gonna be mixed up in the stomach and it's gonna be mixed with gastric juice. So all of the secretions from the stomach that go into the lumen of the stomach is just called gastric juice. So the stomach serves as a temporary reservoir for our food and mixes that food and basically the chyme with the enzymes and acids in the stomach. So the acid in the stomach, if you, if you didn't know that, is hydrochloric acid. We're about to learn how the stomach makes this, by the way. Hydrochloric acid in the stomach, which means the pH of the stomach is very low. There's an enzyme that is secreted by a cell in the stomach and it turns into what we call pepsin. There's also something called intrinsic factor that is secreted in the stomach and another enzyme called gastric lipase. The stomach also produces a hormone 
Yep, the stomach makes a hormone, even though it's not an endocrine gland, and that hormone is called gastrin. All right, we're going to talk about gastrin again in a second. So let's look at the cells that make these particular gastric juice secretions. So what you're looking at here is a graphic of the mucosal lining of the stomach, and you see how they have these indentations in here. These indentations that dive into the mucosa and down into the submucosa are called the gastric pits. Lining the gastric pits are specialized cells that, are, that make up what's called the gastric glands. So what are those cells? Well, you need to know their name and what they make. So there's a cell called the G cell. This one won't be hard to remember because it makes the hormone gastrin, G for gastrin. Gastrin is going to increase the secretion of other gastric glands. So it increases gastric secretion, what's called gastric secretion, and it's going to increase smooth muscle contraction around the stomach, which is called gastric motility. So that's what gastrin does. Basically, it helps activate the actions of what we call the gastric phase of digestion which we don't get to that information to the end of the packet, but the G cells make gastrin, which activates the stomach. The easiest way I could say it for now. The chief cells are the cells that produce the enzymes. So the enzymes that is secreted in gastric juice is called pepsinogen. Notice ogen on the end of that word. That means it's secreted in an inactive form. Pepsinogen is actually activated by the acid into this enzyme, pepsin. So this is the active form of pepsinogen. And pepsin is the enzyme that will begin to break down protein in our food, in our stomach. The chief cells also produce gastric lipase. So whenever you see an enzyme that has lipase in a name like this, it means it breaks down fats and oils basically breaks down triglycerides and whatnot. So in our stomach, we begin to break down protein. But in our mouth, we begin to chemically break down protein in the stomach. But in our mouth, we begin to break down carbohydrates and lipids. Because remember, in our mouth, we have salivary amylase and we have lingual lipase. So salivary amylase and lingual lipase in our mouth begin to chemically break down carbohydrates and lipids, but we don't break down, we don't begin to break down any protein in our mouth. There's no protease that is in saliva. So the first protease, which is the enzyme, that generic name for an enzyme that breaks down protein is pepsin in the stomach. So that's where we begin to break down protein in the stomach. And then we continue to break down some lipids in the stomach with gastric lipase. The parietal cells are the cells that produce the acid and they produce a molecule called intrinsic factor. So I'm just going to tell you what intrinsic factor does now in case I forget to tell you later. Intrinsic factor is required for us to absorb vitamin B12. Without intrinsic factor, we cannot absorb vitamin B12 very efficiently at all. And amongst other things, vitamin B12 is involved in protein production and it's required to, for us to make hemoglobin. So people, as we get older, we actually make less of this intrinsic factor. And with less of this intrinsic factor, we absorb less B vitamins, which makes someone become anemic because they can't make hemoglobin effectively. So they have to go get B12 shots and intrinsic factor and all of that as we get older to subside that anemic attack. So these parietal cells produce the hydrochloric acid, the HCL, right? The last two cells that form the gastric mucosa and, and down into the pit are what we call surface and neck mucus cells. So it's going to be real hard to remember what they do. That's a joke. <laughs> they are mucus cells, which means they make mucus. So let me tell you the importance of this mucus, by the way. The solution, the gastric juice on the inside of our stomach has a very, very low pH because obviously the, the parietal cells are, are making hydrochloric acid. The pH of the stomach in an empty stomach, when you're hungry and you have not put food in it yet, the pH of that gastric juice can get down to 1.5 and 2 on the pH scale. 
And if you actually stuck your finger in a beaker of a solution that had a pH of 1.5, you would melt the skin off of your finger. So that's how acidic our, the inside of our stomach can get. And you, people say, well, how come our, it doesn't eat our stomach lining? Well, sometimes it does in peptic ulcers. That's what an ulcer is, by the way. An ulcer is a, is a part of the stomach lining where the mucus has been eroded away and the acid basically burns through the mucosa and forms a wound called an ulcer. So the mucus actually is a thick layer of mucus lines the inside lining of the gastric mucosa and blocks the acid from destroying the cells in there. So there are several cuboidal cells in there. There's some small columnar looking cells as far as the epithelium that makes up that mucosa. So I want you to know what the cells make right here. Let's look at how our stomach makes acid. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples as to what acid reducers are and all of that. Some of y'all might be familiar with that. So here's a picture of a parietal cell. This would be the gastric mucosa. This would be the extracellular fluid on the outside of the cell. Obviously, this is a capillary over here. On this side of the picture, this is the inside of our stomach where your food is. The liquid food called chyme is all in here. So these parietal cells have to produce hydrochloric acid. So really, what is the molecule of hydrochloric acid? But nothing more than a hydrogen atom, a hydrogen ion, really, and a chloride ion. So these cells have to secrete out into the lumen of the stomach chloride ions and hydrogen ions. So let's look at where they come from. So we looked at briefly the carbonic acid equation already. And I said, at least in lab, we, we did it. We're going to do it in, 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 in this class as well, but we do the respiratory system. But uh, the cells in the stomach and other cells in the body can perform this chemical reaction. So look what this chemical reaction is. It's nothing more than a combination of water and CO2, which is everywhere. There's water and CO2 all over the place. The cells make CO2 as a waste product. So water and CO2 in the presence of carbonic anhydrase. This is the enzyme that catalyzes this step. Carbonic anhydrase combines water and CO2 and forms this acid right here. H2CO3 is called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid splits up into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. So what does the hydrogen do? Well, it gets pumped out of the parietal cell and into the lumen of the stomach. So that is going to become part of the hydrochloric acid molecule. But where's the chloride come from? Hmm. Well, it comes from here. Whenever our cells are performing this carbonic acid equation, the bicarbonate molecule that is liberated always leaves the cell through a special transporter. Now this transporter is called an exchanger because it exchanges one bicarbonate ion, which is negative, it's a negatively charged ion, with one chloride ion. So in, in the extracellular fluid on all the cells in the body, there's more chloride than there is on the outside than there is on the inside. So this bicarbonate ion will go out and then into the blood, and then the chloride will go into the parietal cell and then out into the lumen of the stomach. So that's where the hydrogen and the chloride come from. Now, this might not seem too important right now, but this is very, very important when it comes to um, acid-base balance. Let's say that, uh, which we're gonna get into later, somebody takes way too many Tums. Everybody knows Tums. It neutralizes the acid in the stomach, right? Well, when the stomach pH rises and becomes alkaline, this, the parietal cells are stimulated to perform this reaction much more quickly to make more acid. Well, look what happens to bicarbonate when this cell makes, uh, tries to make hydrochloric acid quicker than normal, they're also making bicarbonate a lot quicker than normal and bicarbonate keeps getting into the blood. So ultimately, people develop what is called metabolic alkalosis because the stomach starts to absorb 
more bicarbonate into the blood and bicarbonate buffers the acid in the blood and raises the pH. So we're gonna talk more about that later on, but this is the chemical reaction that would cause that to happen. All right, so that's where the hydrogen and the chloride come from. But what controls this cell in order to increase or decrease its ability to produce hydrochloric acid? Where there's three molecules that can stimulate and increase acid production. And I want us to know what they are. So look at the second picture over here. Here's the parietal cell again, where all this chemistry is occurring. It's trying to secrete hydrochloric acid, right? So what stimulates it? Well, the parasympathetic nervous system stimulates all phases of digestion. That's one of the roles of the parasympathetic nervous system is to increase digestive function. So what neurotransmitter does the parasympathetic neurons release? Well, they release acetylcholine. So these parietal cells have receptors for acetylcholine. They also have receptors for gastrin. This is the, the hormone that's made by the G cells in the gastric pit. And so gastrin is gonna help stimulate acid production or basically what we call gastric secretion. And then histamine. Now we learned a little bit about this. Histamine basically is an inflammatory molecule, right? Well, it is, and that's true but it has other roles in the body. Histamine is also a signal molecule in this case to help stimulate parietal cells to make more acid. Now the receptor right here, which they don't tell you what, which one this is, but this is what we call an H2 receptor. And I don't know if you guys are familiar, well, I'm sure you are, Zantac and the Pepsid, those types of uh, medications, acid reducers. Well, guess how they act? The function of, of Zantac which is renanotene, is blocks this H2 receptor. So if you block this H2 receptor, histamine can't bind there and it slows this cell down and those people decrease their acid production. That's one type of, of acid reducer, right? Acid production reducer. Another type of acid production reducer actually acts on the parietal cell again, but it doesn't work on the histamine receptors. It actually works on this pump. You see this pump right here that pumps the hydrogen out? I'm sure you heard of Prilosec and Prevacid. Those are two other types of, of acid reducing uh, drugs. They don't work on this receptor. They, work, they block this, this pump right here. So if the cell can't pump out hydrogen, you're decreasing your acid production. So I just thought you guys might wanna know that. Some of y'all might even take that for upset stomach or acid reflux and things like that. At least for yeah. the test, go ahead. Okay, so what's the difference in between taking either one of them? Okay, so either they, they both have different types of side effects. So some people mm -hmm. have more side effects from one of them from, than from the other one, and so they mm -hmm. opt to do the other drug. So it just depends okay. on the person. Both of okay. them are, yeah, that, you see what I'm saying? It's all about yeah. the side effects. Okay. Yeah, they both are going to stop acid, or I don't want to say stop. It's going to reduce acid production, but they do so mm -hmm. in two different mechanisms. That's all. Okay. Okay. Very good. Good question. All right. So also throughout the PowerPoint, make sure you go through these little animations. In this PowerPoint, I put a bunch of them um, in there. Some of them are short. Some of them are a little longer. And I think some of these will actually help you out a little more for, lecture, uh, for lab than lecture, but I'd like for you guys to review them. All right, so I also have these summation tables that come directly out of your book, all right? So you need to make sure you review these things and obviously focus on when, where I tell you to focus on them. Like the first one, just learn the salivary gland. I'm not gonna ask you about the extrinsic muscles of the tongue and all that. On this one, I want you to know what the structures and cells are what they actually do, so for instance, the G cells secrete gastrin or the parietal cells secrete intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid. The other thing I do want you to know is what the generic result is of those molecules that are being released or their function. So for instance, the intrinsic factor is responsible for the absorption of vitamin B12, which I just told you. Hydrochloric acid is involved in destroying microbes we might eat, but also the hydrochloric acid is involved in denaturing 
large molecules like proteins. So I don't know if you know what the word denature is. Denaturing is when you take a big molecule that's all wound up on itself and you unwind it and make it into a long string. That's the easiest way I could describe it. So in order for our enzymes to get into the bonds, the chemical bonds, the molecule can't be folded up on itself. If the molecules like proteins are folded up on themselves, the enzyme can't get to the middle of it. So what the acid does is it causes the proteins to unfold. And when those proteins unfold, that's called denaturation. It basically exposes the chemical bonds to the enzymes, in this case, pepsin. So pepsin is going to act from the chief cells is going to act on those proteins that are being denatured by the hydrochloric acid. So again, just go through the molecules and know what they do from this summary slide right here. Um, All right, go ahead. Somebody's got a question. Oh, I thought I heard something. I'm sorry. All right. So let's get into the pancreas. The pancreas is an accessory organ of digestion. So we, so far we have the teeth in our tongue. We chew our food up and macerate it in our mouth. Oh, and I forgot to tell you that the process of chewing your food up is called mastication. I don't know if I told you all that. So when we masticate or we're, we're, we're masticating our food, we're chewing it up, right? So our teeth and our tongue mixes it with saliva. Our pancreas is also an accessory organ of digestion because it's not part of the tube. So our pancreas lies posterior and just inferior to our stomach. It's along the left lateral side of our, of our body. Um, it is basically two different types of glands. I'm in, in this chapter, I'm concerned with the majority of the pancreas. In chapter 18, we were concerned with the pancreatic islets, if you remember that, the hormone producing structure. But we're concerned with the acinus and the acinized cells that make up 98% of all the cells of the pancreas. So those cells produce a whole bunch of enzymes that are involved in the, the chemical digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and our nucleic acids, which are RNA and DNA, if you don't remember what those uh, poly uh, polymers are. So these, these are RNA and DNA molecules. The pancreas also produces bicarbonate ions. Now bicarbonate ions, as I mentioned before, we just saw them here, they actually can buffer acid. And that's exactly what bicarbonate is. It's an acid buffer. So the issue here is that all of these enzymes that are produced by the pancreas are actually secreted via the pancreatic duct into the small intestine. The first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum. So the enzymes that are produced by the pancreas and even the enzymes in the intestine, they cannot work at an acidic pH. In fact, they don't work well at all in a, in a very acidic pH, in a low pH. So when the, the food, the chyme, is leaving the stomach, and entering the small intestine, it has to, the acid has to be buffered. Remember, the contents of the stomach is very acidic. So what buffers the acid chyme, the acidic chyme, when it comes into the small intestine? Well, the bicarbonate ions that the pancreas is producing, as well as the liver. The liver is going to secrete some for us as well. So ultimately, all of those secretions from the pancreas, <clears throat> excuse me, is called generically pancreatic juice. So we have gastric juice, that's everything in the stomach. We have pancreatic juice, that's all the water and enzymes and, and whatnot secreted by the pancreas, right, into the duodenum. And we're, we're going to look at what those enzymes do in a minute. But let's get into the liver and the gallbladder first. So the liver is actually a huge chemistry set in our body, by the way. It's part of a bunch of different systems. I mean, it's involved in everything about our blood, and here it's involved everything with our, our digestive system, preparing food molecules that we absorb into the blood system. It does a lot for us, but it's also an excretory organ because it's going to produce an excretory product 
which is called bile. Now bile has specific roles, but it's also a excretory product that allows our liver to get rid of waste products and secrete them into the small intestine. So let me show you how that's achieved without the picture of the liver, obviously. But there's a couple of lobes, a few lobes on the liver. There's two primary lobes, a right one and a left one. The, the uh, lobes of the liver are going to produce bile. The bile is then going to be secreted from the liver in what's called the biliary system of ducts. The ducts are these, and it will help you out to identify them if you know where the ducts come from. So there's something called a right hepatic duct. It comes from the whole right side of the liver. It's going to drain bile from the right half of the liver down into what's called a common hepatic duct. All of the bile draining the left-hand side of the liver is drained via the left hepatic duct. Now, where the right duct and the left duct join together, from that point, see how it turns into a Y? From that point down is called a common hepatic. So you have a right and a left hepatic. They join together. We form the common hepatic. Now, where the common hepatic duct joins the cystic duct from the liver, I mean from the gallbladder, where they join together from that point down to the duodenum is called the common bile duct. So this is the biliary system. You have a right and left hepatic, you have a common hepatic, where the common hepatic joins the cystic duct. See how it forms another Y right there? Where it joins with the cystic duct, from that point down to the duodenum is called the common bile duct. Now the gallbladder, as you may already know, is a temporary storage site for bile. So that's where bile can be stored. So if we eat a meal that's rich in fat, <clears throat> there's a hormone that's released that's gonna cause the gallbladder to contract and it squishes more bile out into the common bile duct if we need it. If you don't eat a meal that's rich in fat, we don't need a whole bunch of bile. So what does bile do then? Well, bile is involved in emulsification of fats. So bile is gonna take the fats in our diet, which basically are oil droplets at that point. And you know oil and water don't mix, right? So all the fats and basically oils that we consume in our diet form these little oil droplets in our in the water everywhere in the system and even into your blood as, a, as it gets into your blood. Little bitty uh, fat molecules in there. But in your digestive system, all of the enzymes are water soluble, which means the enzymes, the lipases, have a hard time attacking all of the fats because they're, they're coagulated together into this big droplet. So to increase the surface area available for the enzymes to act on the lipids, we have to make that big oil droplet into millions of very small oil droplets. That's called emulsification. So bile emulsifies fats for us, right? So ultimately besides bile being secreted, and that's along with what we call bile salts into the duodenum where emulsification occurs, the liver performs several other things. Number one, after we absorb our food molecules into the blood from the digestive system, all of your nutrients that you're absorbing, except for fats, go straight to the liver first from your digestive system. So when we absorb our sugar, our carbohydrates, our lipid, not lipids, they don't go first, but they do go to the liver later. But all your carbohydrates, your amino acids from proteins, the components of nucleic acids, all of those go straight to your liver and the liver chemically modifies them and prepares them to be used by the cells in the body. So basically the liver is another processing plant that's gonna help manipulate the molecules so the cells can use them for whatever they need to use them for. The liver can also eradicate or get rid of any um, metabolites of drugs or hormones that are circulating in our blood. Our liver gets rid of all of that. How do they get rid of all of that? Well, the liver can break them down and then secrete them into the duodenum via bile. 
And bilirubin is a breakdown component of red blood cells. We already know that, right? So bilirubin is secreted in bile. Uh, bile is a component of various lipids and bile salts. All of that's secreted into the duodenum. Your liver also stores a couple of things for us that are pretty important. I bet you could probably name at least one of them. The liver stores iron for us, which is required to make hemoglobin. We learned that in the blood chapter. But your liver is also a major storage site for sugar, a polysaccharide called glycogen. And then the liver can perform phagocytosis. Remember, we can pull out some dead or dying red blood cells in there, the macrophages in there. And then the liver is involved in the activation of vitamin D. So it's one of the sites where vitamin D uh, activation occurs, but it's not activated to its most active form. The, the kidneys do that. But it is an intermediate site for vitamin D uh, chemical modification. So let's talk about the small intestine and see what goes on in the small intestine. The small intestine begins at the shortest part of the small intestine, something called the duodenum. So your small intestine on average, depending on your body size, can be up to 20 feet long, give or take the person. But the smallest section is a duodenum and the duodenum attaches directly to the stomach at an area called the pylorus. So the contents of the stomach, the chyme that the stomach is trying to secrete into the duodenum through a process called gastric emptying, the stomach will empty the chyme into the duodenum first. It then goes through the jejunum and then to the largest part called the ileum. The ileum then attaches to the large intestine or something called the colon over here on the right side, the right lower quadrant of your abdominal cavity. So what are the functions of the small intestine? Well, the small intestine still helps mix up chyme with all the digestive juices and brings the food, the chyme, into contact with the intestinal mucosa. All the cells that line the mucosa of the intestine where absorption will occur. The small intestine also has the job of moving the chyme through the small intestine and thus through the GI tract towards the colon. Notice right here, I misspelled the word chyme. This is where I misspelled it. That should be a Y, by the way. So peristalsis is a smooth muscle contraction along the length of the stomach. But what really happens in the small intestine? Well, the small intestine is the area where we have almost all of the absorption of our nutrients, about 90% of our nutrients and water, electrolytes, whatnot, absorbed in, from our small intestine. Also, the small intestine is where we finalize and complete the chemical breakdown of all of our food items via our enzymes. So the enzymes that we make, whether it was in our mouth in saliva, the enzymes from your gastric lining, the enzymes from the pancreas. There are enzymes made in the small intestines even, but the enzymes from the pancreas work in the small intestine. So the chemical digestion we complete of carbohydrates, all proteins, lipids, everything in the small intestine. And the reason why I'm telling you that is this. Once we get to the colon in a second, no human enzyme is made in the colon, not one. But we do have bacteria that line our colon and the bacteria can help break down some things in there, but it's not from our enzymes, all right? All right, all right so we chemically break down everything in our small intestine and then we absorb all of our nutrients there. So let's talk about something called a brush border enzyme. Brush border, by the way, is the area of the intestinal mucosa that has these invaginated folds in it. And the invaginated folds form finger-like projections called villi. At the surface of the villi are the epithelial cells you learned about in AMP1. Simple, non-ciliated, columnar epithelium. And at their apical membrane, they have highly folded areas of their plasma membrane up there, which are called microvilli. Now those cells 
just lining the villus. So here's a villus, a finger-like projection, just lining the surface of all of these absorptive cells, the simple columnar epithelium, are invaginations of the membrane up there. That's called a microvilli. So embedded in that microvilli is some mucus and some enzymes. And I'm going to show you what those enzymes are in a second. But the enzymes that are lined up here are called brush border enzymes. All right. So I'm about to show you where, what all the enzymes are and what they do. Before we do that, let's look at the cells that make up the villus and the cells that make up what we call the intestinal glands. So the intestinal glands, like the gastric glands, are found in these little invaginated pockets in the mucosa. So those glands in the intestine contain cells that are called the panath cell. The panath cells produce uh, bacteriolytic molecules like lysozyme. So we're introducing bacteria into our gut constantly. So these panna cells make lysozyme that can help kill bacteria. They also are phagocytic. So they can phagocytize microbes and help get rid of them that way. We also have cells that can produce some hormones for us to help regulate aspects of digestion. The cells in the intestinal glands that make some hormones for us are generically called enteroendocrine cells. So we're gonna talk about a couple of these and one other one at the very end. We're going to talk about what secretin is and what cholecystokinin is. Um, we're not going to get into the function of GIP, but these enteroendocrine cells produce three, these three different hormones, and they all help in some way control the intestinal phase of digestion. Then we have the goblet cells. These are basically a, a fancy name for a mucus cell. They secrete mucus, just like the neck and surface mucus cells in the gastric mucosa. They, have, they secrete a mucus lining around the mucosa in the small intestine. And then Did he cut out? It freeze, it froze. Oh, okay. It cut out. the absorptive cell. Now it kicked him out. Hello, students. Can you all hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, sir. That yes. really bites the big one. Thirsty. Well, um, let's see. Can anybody tell me where you lost me? Because I just kept talking. Talking about absorptive cells. Oh. Just okay. finished talking about the goblet cells. Oh, very good. So you, I didn't talk a whole lot after that. All right, well, good. The goblet cells secrete the mucus. Um, so just basically know what these cells do. Uh, and the absorptive cell, basically up here is where the brush border enzymes are located. So we're going to talk about the enzymes uh, in a second. 
And here are uh, the enzymes all in one place off the summary chart. So these two summary charts, I'm going to have several questions from. I want you to focus on them. So over here, there's basically a uh, know what the enzyme is and where it comes from. So you see how it's, set, it's, it's sectioned out? Salivary amylase and lingual lipase is in saliva, pepsin and gastric lipase, so what we talked about, and then the pancreatic enzymes down here. So all of these are pancreatic enzymes. I want you, uh, uh, let's see, so you have to know where they come from. You don't, you don't have to know, well, all of these come from the ACE and R cells. You don't have to worry about that. Just know that it comes from the pancreas. The only ones you have to know what cells they come from, like the stomach, you have to know the chief cells make these enzymes. You don't have to know, um, just know that these are in saliva. I'm not going to ask you about the lingual glands on the tongue. You do need to know what they break down though. So when it says substrate, that's the molecule that the enzyme starts to work on and start to break the chemical bonds on. All right. And just know what they, br they break down into. So proteins are large molecules that are broken down into smaller proteins, just called peptides. So that's what pepsin does. But then we have all of these enzymes right here. So let me describe to you what they are. Um, we already know what an amylase is. An amylase breaks down starch and carbohydrates. So this pancreatic amylase comes from the pancreas. It breaks down starch into these smaller carbohydrates. But these enzymes right here are all proteases. Trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, carboxypeptidase. All of these are proteases. So what is a protease? A protease is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. So you can see these are all going to break down some proteins into smaller proteins called peptides. But then we have carboxypeptidase. So this, this name, if you knew this, the molecular structure of an amino acid, you would understand the name. I'm not, I can't draw it out. I usually draw it out on the board in class, but you don't have to know the structure. But carboxypeptidase is basically break down individual amino acids, specifically at the end of the amino acid called the carboxyl end. And that's why it's called, called carboxy. See, an amino acid has an amino end and a carboxyl end. It has a head end and a tail end. So this enzyme breaks off the tail end. It's back, basically a carboxylic acid, it breaks it off of the amino acid. But you just have to know that carboxypeptidases break down amino acids. We're not gonna learn the structure, the carboxyl ends and the amino ends and all of that. Just know carboxypeptidase breaks down amino acids. Pancreatic lipase is the lipase that we rely on the most to break down fats in our diet. Although we have gastric lipase and lingual lipase, these only begin to break down about 20% of our fats. Um, pancreatic lipase breaks down the majority of our fats in our small intestine. Oh, and all of these are working in the small intestine, by the way, because pancreatic juice goes to the small intestine. Gastric enzymes are working in the stomach and salivary en enzymes are working in the mouth. So once the salivary enzymes hit the stomach, they go inactive. Once the gastric enzymes reach the small intestine, they go inactive, so forth and so forth, so, so on, all right? All right, so I put in some animations to show you how the chemical digestion of the different molecules are performed. I think that'll help you out. I cut out again? No, no, I have a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, okay, so for those charts, you just want us to focus on the enzyme source and substrate, not the products. Correct. Okay. Yes, most definitely. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, let me see. Uh, oh, we didn't get there yet. Okay, that's why. I do want us to know what, the, what they're going to specifically break down in a second. But let's go over the colon real quick. Okay. And then the summary, and then we go into the, the, the other enzymes and then uh, the brush borders, and then we're gonna get into the last thing we have to talk about, and that is basically regulation of digestion, at least one part of it. Now, as far as the colon is concerned, we don't have any of our own enzymes produced in the colon, none. All of our enzymes are produced in salivary glands, uh, the pancreas secreted into the 
small intestine or the brush border enzymes, which are made by the intestinal lining directly. So the colon though can have some breakdown of certain things in there, but it's performed by bacteria. So before I tell you that, let's get into this. There's something called haustral churning. If we look at the colon, its structure, the colon has all these little segmented parts on it. Everybody see that? I'm sure everybody would be able to recognize that anyway, if you've ever seen a colon before. Those segmented portions or pouches right there are called haustra. So those haustra are lined by smooth muscle and they perform what's called haustral churning. So basically it helps compress the food items that are entering the colon. And all the way along the length of the colon, the food items keep getting compressed and compressed and compressed as they move along and it squishes the water out of it. So we're trying to extract as much water and some electrolytes out of the rest of the food items that are entering the colon because in our colon, we're gonna absorb some water, we're gonna absorb some electrolytes, which are the ions, and we're gonna absorb some vitamins. So this is basically what's absorbed in the colon. So as we are compressing the food items in there down, we're basically extracting water out of it. Now, we also have something called mass peristalsis. So mass peristalsis is what happens when your food items reach the left-hand side of our colon and in the area what we call uh, just at the end of the transverse colon and approaching the descending colon. You start to get contractions, mass contractions in your colon that forces the waste products, which we call the fecal matter, down into the sigmoid colon. And sometimes you get that cramping over there, that's because your colon is trying to force your, your waste products down so you can go to the bathroom. That's what mass peristalsis is. It tries to drive the contents, the colonic contractions down to the rectum. The rectum is that temporary site that the, the fecal matter can be stored in before we go to the bathroom. Um, now there's bacteria all in our colon, the good bacteria at least. The good bacteria in our colon can still break down some molecules that we were not able to break down chemically in the rest of our digestive system. So they break down some proteins into amino acids and other indigestible fibrous material. Those bacteria that are performing that job also produce gases when they do that as a waste product. And that is partly the flatulence that we have in our large intestines. But the more important thing that is of interest here physiologically is that the bacteria in the large intestine produce several B vitamins for us and vitamin K, which I didn't put vitamin K, but they produce say uh, B12, which is important. 50% of our B12 can come from the bacteria in our gut. And so that's involved in protein production. In this case that we talked about before, the production of hemoglobin, right? And then uh, we have the formation of the feces in the colon and then we defecate. So those are the functions of the colon. So here are, in one summary chart, the basic functions of all parts of the digestive system. So just read through some of these uh, functions is what I just mentioned through the slides. So right before the test, you can just review these generic functions and you'll probably be able to remember everything and answer the questions from it. Now, the last thing that we have to cover is the regulation of digestion. Now we're not gonna go through the regulation of all parts, but I did wanna include this. The digestive system process is separated into three main phases, something called the cephalic phase. And this cephalic phase is when you're thinking about food or you go somewhere and you start to smell food. Ooh, I'm hungry, man, I'm, I'd really like to get some food, I'm hungry. So once you begin before you even put food in your stomach, in your mouth, and you're, you feel hunger, and you're smelling food, you might start to salivate. Your sal salivary glands start to produce saliva, even before you. He went out. He went out. I yeah. went out again? Okay, yeah. You said the stomach. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat it. You said the sal salivary glands begin to produce. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, the basic thing about the cephalic phase is that your head. 
Cephalic means head, your brain. So when you're thinking about food and you're hungry, before you even eat, your digestive system is preparing for incoming food. So that's what happens in the cephalic phase. You salivate, your stomach starts to produce gastric juice and whatnot. Then once you start to take food into the system, you start chewing food up and you start putting food in the stomach, you, you enter what's called the gastric phase. Now there's some overlap between cephalic and gastric, but once you're in the full gastric phase, that's when you have put food in your stomach, your stomach starts to stretch. So there's stretch receptor reflexes that help activate more stomach motility and more stomach gastric, or I should say gastric secretion, along with the neuronal effects. So all effects, all phases are affected by the nervous system, basically neurotransmitters and or hormones. And the cephalic phase is the phase that begins us to prepare for incoming food. So I'm going to talk about the gastric phase in a second off the negative feedback loop. But once food starts to go from the stomach into the duodenum, the small intestine, that's called gastric emptying. You then begin the intestinal phase. There's a little bit of overlap with the intestinal phase depending on the type of food items you have eaten. Um, if you eat a meal that is rich in protein and fat, the intestinal phase will take over and start to slow down the gastric phase because it takes a lot longer for our enzymes to break down chemically protein and fats in our small intestine. So the stomach can't just empty its entire contents at one time because we would never digest chemically everything in our small intestine. So what is interesting are the cells know what type of food you eat and Depending on if you eat a large sugary meal, your stomach empties quicker. If you eat a meal that's rich in fat, your stomach empties more slowly. And that's controlled by hormones. So once the food goes into the intestine, we begin the intestinal phase. So let's talk about this regulation. Here's a negative feedback loop for the regulation of the gastric phase of digestion. So let's see how this works. Well, ultimately we have receptors in the lining of our stomach that can monitor the chemical changes and monitor the degree to which the stomach lining is stretched. So we have what are called chemoreceptors and stretch receptors. So look what happens when you begin to put food in your stomach. Once you start to eat and you put food into your stomach, the food contents is going to absorb the acid and it makes the pH of the stomach go up. So once the pH of the stomach starts to go up and become more alkaline, the chemoreceptors say, hey, wait a minute. The acid in our, the, the pH in our stomach is not low enough. We need to make more acid, right? Because the, the stomach contents is supposed to be acidic. Also, when you start to put food in your stomach and your stomach begins to stretch, the stretch receptors fire and it causes for nerve, all of these cause for nerve impulses to come from a special nerve plexus in the lining of the stomach itself called the submucosal plexus. There's a secondary plexus called the myenteric plexus. Both of those plexuses uh, produce parasympathetic uh, stimulation, which release acetylcholine. So acetylcholine increases parietal cell function, which releases hydrochloric acid. So as the food entering the stomach absorbs the acid and the pH rises, the parietal cells are stimulated to make more acid. Can y'all still hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, a little. My whole table just fell. Yeah. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I don't know how that happened. But now my computer is halfway on the ground. Sorry about that but we're almost done. All right, so y'all can still hear me? Yeah. All right, yeah. good. All right, so the chemoreceptors cause for more acid production, but the stretch receptors cause for contraction of the stomach lining. So that causes increased motility. So this will go on and on and on until 
the stomach receives hormones that cause gastric emptying. So let's look at some of those hormones right here, which is the last thing that we really have to cover. So on this summary slide right here, I want you to know the hormone name. I want you to know what stimulates it. And I only want you to know the major effect. Don't worry about this minor effect right here. So gastrin is produced by the stomach when we actually ingest protein and caffeine and the, the chyme becomes a little bit alkaline. So at a high pH, which becomes alkaline, you start eating food, gastrin is gonna be released from the G cells. So what does it do? Well, it stimulates an increase in gastric motility and gastric secretion. So that increases the gastric phase of digestion. But what happens once the stomach starts emptying chyme into the small intestine? Well, we have the secretion of secretin and cholecystokinin. So go through the stimulating factors right here for both of these and just learn their primary effect that you see right here. All right, so since I'm holding my computer in my lap right now, I think I have to end this session and I have to fix this table. I don't know how that thing just fell. So let me stop sharing. Does anybody have any 